very much and I'll see you and we will see you after the break. All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our final round of presentations for the Synthel 2021 conference. This is the lightning round. Um, the talks that you will hear over the next hour were selected from the poster competition that we had on the first day of the conference. Um, the posters were judged by three, um, three people. Um, the votes were tallied and what you'll hear today um, were the, the top rated poster presenters from from that competition. So we'll start off with Jefferson Smith. He is a graduate student at the University of Oxford in Professor Michael Booth's lab in the Department of Chemistry. Um, Jefferson, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and we can start. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. You're you're not in presenter mode yet. There we go. There you go. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much to the organizers for giving me the chance to share my research. Um, it's been a really nice conference, some great talks, and yeah, hopefully we get to do it again at some point. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about my PhD project, which is light activated gene expression inside synthetic cells. So I'll give a brief introduction, but we don't really need to introduce it that much because so many people have been talking about it. But 
What do I mean by synthetic cells? And so what I'm referring to are compartments, in my case, a GUV or a giant Ulina-Mela vesicle, in which you encapsulate a cell-free protein synthesis system, in my case, Pure Express, and DNA templates encoding for a gene of interest. And so the idea is that you get in situ gene expression, so converting the gene of interest into mRNA and then into the protein, all inside the compartment, and then that protein of interest will uh, govern the function of that compartment. And so a few good examples of uh, how this has been used in the literature shown on the right. So the paper from Kate Adamala in 2017, by which he showed that uh, synthetic cell populations could respond to small molecules and express alpha hemolysin and then release a secondary messenger, which would then regulate gene expression in a second compartment. And uh, a recent paper from the Mansi group by which they used three oxohexanol hemicellin lactone to activate gene expression. And so they activate uh, profingolysin O expression, which then releases uh, brain derived neurotrophin factor to uh, induce differentiation in neural stem cells. And so one of the things that's kind of shared between these two works, even though they are quite different, is kind of the mechanisms for activating the um, the gene expression and that it's in the first case membrane permeable small molecules so in this case a rabinose or theophylline and in the bottom case a homostrain lactone or using a membrane impermeable small molecule and a membrane pore and although these works are very good I, feel, I still feel there are limitations as to how we regulate the gene expression that occurs because for example the ribos which is used here are uh, often quite leaky and quite uh, weak. So the ribosome binding site is quite weak. So the expression you get is relatively low. And um, if you wanted to use a non-membrane uh, membrane impermeable molecule, then if you had a port in the membrane, then everything is going to start leaking out. So what we are proposing in our group is that we use light activated DNA templates that have been chemically modified so that we can uh, regulate all of this process in response to light. And so to do this, uh, this is the light activated DNA that we use. And to do this, we create a photo cage T7 promoter. So the T7 promoter sequence is shown here. And each of the positions shown in X is a thymine that has been replaced with an amino thymine. And so there are seven of them throughout the promoter sequence. And then what we do is we conjugate a photocleavable biotinylated linker to this amine. So then at each of these positions shown in X, we've uh, decorated the primer with this uh, long molecule. And then subsequently, we bind monovalent streptalid into each of these uh, biotin groups so that we can block the binding of T7 polymerase to the promoter. And that happens until we irradiate with UV light when we get photocleavage at the two nitro benzyl group and we deprotect the promoter. And this allows for transcription and translation. So we can show this process on a gel. So if we take the, the DNA containing a photocleavable biotin group, you can bind streptavidin and it decreases the electrophoretic mobility of the DNA and causes the band shift. And then after you irradiate with UV light, it starts to return back to normal. And you can track this with cell-free uh, expression. So in the absence of UV light, you get low expression where the T7 promoter is uh, protected, but then you can restore expression by irradiating to UV light. So this has been used in droplet networks before, but my project is to try and do this in synthetic cells. So we can do this. So if I look, uh, draw your attention to here, we're using the same schematic as before, but using mneon green DNA, which has the light activated T7 uh, promoter. And if you look at the top panel, there's no DNA present, so you don't see any gene expression. In the bottom panel, they both contain the light activated DNA. In the case on the left, that has no UV, so there is no expression. On the right, this is experienced uh, UV irradiation, so you start to express mneon green. And you can take this a step further and you can start patterning this. So in the top case, we've immobilized, immobilized the vesicles in agarose and then used uh, a strip of light to pattern uh, activation of just this uh, population of synthetic cells within the strip uh, and they will activate gene expression. And in the bottom case, I use a photo machine here. It looks a bit odd, but um, it's a smiley face. So the eyes and the mouth will experience UV radiation. And so um, you see that the amnion green is expressed in these vesicles, which have been mobilized onto the cover slope. So this is uh, a nice platform to use, but can we do anything more significant with it? And the platform I hope to achieve was uh, synthetic communication between the synthetic cells and E. coli. So to do this, I implemented a BJAI, BJAR quorum sensing system from Brady Rhizobium japonicum. And so it's shown in this schematic. So if we express the BJAI, BJAI enzyme in the compartment, 
This is an enzyme that performs this reaction, which is highlighted down here. So it takes S adenosyl methionine and isovaleryl CoA, which are membrane impermeable, and produces a membrane permeable quorum sensing molecule, isovaleryl homosterone lactone. And so this can diffuse across through uh, the lipid bio and activate gene expression in E. coli if they express BJAR. So BJAR is under the control of a constitutive promoter and then can bind to the lactone and regulate this uh, LUX type promoter, which contains the BJAR binding site and activate GFP expression. So I'm going to kind of skip to the final experiment rather than go through each of the steps that I took. But the system works. So if we have synthetic cells immobilized in an M9 agarose, and um, then plate some of the uh, E. coli that uh, respond to the lactone on top. If we add no DNA to the synthetic cells, we don't see any BGI expression and lactone production. And the same is true if we have no UV, but if we activate the synthetic cells with UV, they produce the lactone. And as you can see, micro colonies of the cells will start to fluoresce. And so we feel this is a nice platform for the in situ kind of controlled production of small molecules and therapeutics. But in terms of the communication stuff, it could also be useful for like bringing together the living, uh, living cells and synthetic cells to create kind of microbial communities. So I want to thank my supervisor, Michael Booth, for his continued support and Dennis Hartman for making the synthetic lactone that I use as my standard, and as well as the rest of the Booth group and Bailey group for their uh, useful discussion and support in the lab. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Great, thank you, Jefferson. That was um, really excellent work. Um, I do have a, just more of a technical question for you. I'm wondering um, if when you're embedding your synthetic cells into the M9 agros, if you ran into any um, problems with the stability of, of the synthetic cells over time. Yeah, so the biggest problem for me was the osmolarity. So the osmolarity of the pure express is around one osmolar. And the, obviously the media is, I think I got it to about 370 milliosmoles. So in order to get it down, I have to actually dilute it, but I've done some calibrations and it didn't actually perturb the expression that much. So that was the single most important thing in terms of the stability within the, the media itself. Um, one, other, one other thing could be like when I'm preparing the agro is just making sure not to compress it. So no mechanical agitation. Um, but yeah, the single most important thing was the osmolarity. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from David Gonzalez. He asks, mm -hmm. are SAM and CoA added to the IVT reaction mix separately? What range of concentrations are they in? Um, so I just took the concentrations from a paper that worked on the kinetics of BJI. So um, I think it was about 80, I have a slide a bit later on actually, one second. So this is just like a the BGI kind of data. So if I added them at 300 micromolar for the uh, for the SAM and 80 for the CoA, I was getting back about 35 micromolar. So it's not 100% conversion, but it's far above the threshold because I need uh, around about one nanomolar concentration to fully activate my my reporter. So yeah, it was above and beyond what I needed, but. I haven't kind of optimized this. This was just taking it directly from what other people have worked on. Okay, okay last question. Um, UVA light is known to cause DNA double strand breaks. Did you notice any such effects? So we're using 365 nanometers. So it's kind of, I guess, away from 260 or 280, sorry, which is obviously the most harmful. Um, there is kind of a, a trade-off between achieving full photocleavage and damaging the DNA. So there's a sweet spot where you've fully, or you've achieved full um, kind of expression capabilities, even if there's maybe one or two of the, the blocking groups still there. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a trade-off between fully activating the system and then damaging it. Sure. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Okay. We're gonna move on now. Um, our next presenter is Telmo Diaz Perez. He is a graduate student at the University of Mexico and Professor Gabriel Lopez and Nick Carroll's labs, um, working in two centers, the Center for Microengineering Materials and uh, the Center for Biomedical Engineering. Um, so Telmo, thanks for sharing your slides. And whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you, Jacqueline. So thank you everyone for listening and giving me this opportunity. My name is Telma Diaz Perez, and I'm here to talk to you about uh, my work in recombinant intrinsically disordered proteins 
for trigger sequestration of nucleic acids via liquid-liquid phase separation. Among this dense title, I want to start uh, speaking about intrinsically disordered protein, which, as uh, most of you know, they're a type of proteins that do not have any type of a structure. They're, as the name indicates, disorder, and they're more like a random coil. They tend to be low complexity uh, proteins, not necessarily, but the ones I'm going to talk about today, which are called elastin-like polypeptides, are. And those are recombinant synthetic uh, intrinsically disordered proteins that are based on a pentameric uh, repeat composed of valine, proline, glycine, a gas residue label X, and glycine again. These uh, five amino acids repeated an n number of times uh, give rise to these ELPs, elastin like polypeptides, which are low critical solution uh, temperature polymer. And this is a very interesting concept because these proteins can undergo a phenomena called liquid liquid phase separation upon the addition of a thermal stimulus. Uh, the way this works is below a certain temperature, a temperature that we're going to call transition temperature or cloud point, uh, these polymers are soluble and uh, you can see it in the tube, it, it's just clear like water. Above the, when you increase the transition, when you increase the temperature above a certain transition temperature, uh, you see that these proteins start to get turbid and they start to condensate forming a, a phase separated protein condensate or coacervate that is going to be separated from the aqueous media they were originally at. And this phenomenon is very interesting because it's fully reversible. So this allows you to go back and forth between soluble phase and two phase state as many times as you want. The rationale of this experiment is that we're gonna, we're gonna engineer or we engineered an ELP, a charged, positively charged ELP with a few lysine residues dispersed through the sequence that is capable of uh, capturing and releasing uh, nucleic acid on demand, forming and uh, deforming, assembling and disassembling a protein uh, DNA membraneless like organ. And this type of membraneless like organelle and biomolecular condensates are very interesting things for numerous of, for a big number of applications. And here we develop a very easy system capable of capturing and release on demand upon a thermal stimulus. Uh, in order to do that, we study two different proteins. We study, as I mentioned, an electrostatically charged protein named E3 and a neutral uh, ELP named E140. First of all, we characterize the ELPs, which is uh, something very typical when you work with this type of proteins, and we characterize the transition temperature. So the temperature at which they start undergoing liquid phase separation. In order to do that, you have to measure the optical density or the absorbance of the, of the protein as a measure as a function of temperature. Because when they're soluble, they're, it's very close to zero. And then as you can see in this graph, it makes a huge jump. As you can observe in both graphs, uh, this is a compilation and this is just some raw data. The presence of DNA in a solution with the cationic uh, polymer, it's lowering the transition temperature. So it's adding to the driving force that heat stresses. However, in the, uh, the neutral ELP, E140, in the presence of DNA, it's not, uh, it doesn't see its transition temperature altered. So this is the first uh, um, notification we have about this uh, phenomenon. The second thing we do is we do a fluorescent quantification of the DNA binding in the quasar. The way we do that is that we prepare a series of dilutions of E3 in a phosphate buffer uh, with a fluorescently labeled uh, DNA. And then we prepare the same set of dilutions in a phosphate buffer with an excess of sodium chloride. Uh, what we found from our assay is that most of the fluorescent signal of the DNA upon phase separation is localized in the protein rich phase, so in the quasar rate, in that membraneless protein uh, organelle. However, when you do this experiment in the buffer with a high concentration of salt, with a high concentration of sodium chloride, you observe that the DNA fluorescence is not localized in the protein complex. It's localized all over the sample, meaning that the DNA didn't partition with the protein upon phase separation. And that's probably due because our interactions are purely electrostatic. And uh, the addition of uh, salt is shielding the charges. In this slide, you can see a video of what uh, liquid liquid phase separation looks like in the presence of DNA. And uh, what you can see very well is that the DNA starts forming puncta, and those puncta start coalescing in a liquid like behavior in the middle of these spherical water oil droplets. And these are just microenvironments of uh, E3 with DNA. And what is very nice about this is that it's reversible. So once you cool down, you're gonna see, now that in the video we're cooling down, how the DNA goes back into solution 
uh, because the protein is going back into solution. So you can go back and forth in this phenomena as many times as you want. It's a very simple DNA uh, capture and release on demand. And we can observe in panel C, uh, what I just showed in the video, but we can also observe what happens if you add salt or if you add a polymer that is not charged. What you see, the DNA instead of localizing almost completely in the middle of the sphere, so in the protein uh, membraneless organelle, it's localizing all over the place because it doesn't really have a preference for any phases. So here, you're not forming a protein DNA organelle, you're just forming a protein organelle and the DNA is just uh, moving around without doing anything. Well, this is interesting because we develop a model, a very simple model of a membraneless uh, nuclear protein, a protein that is capable, as I say, of capturing and releasing nucleic acid on demands. I showed here DNA, but we've, we've been working with uh, RNA and a single uh, double-stranded DNA and different type of nucleic acids. And right now, uh, two brilliant people, my colleague Adam Quintana and my advisor, Dr. Nick Carroll, are doing a theoretical study to define the, the component phase partition in this coasterbate, so how much buffer, how much DNA, and how much E3 is partitioning in, upon phase separation. And uh, myself, I'm working with different ELP-based constructs for more, more robust nucleic acid binding because E3 in reality is a very good binder. Where uh, below something like 80 millimolar, we're not binding DNA anymore. So we created uh, different uh, constructs that are capable of binding DNA in the order of uh, three micromolar and even less. However, it depends on what type of domains you add. You can have a liquid, perfect, full reversible liquid liquid phase operation. But for example, if you add, start adding some order domains, you can also have uh, some issues and you can lose that liquid liquid reversible phase separation. Just wanted to say that ELPs are highly tunable and modular, and they have a lot of ground to incorporate other protein domains for different functions. And this is what we're working on right now to have a different type of robust nucleic acid binding domain or a specific, a specific interaction or interactions with other type of molecules all inside this protein membraneless organ. And thank you very much for my mentors, lab mates, uh, advisors, and the funding organization. Excellent. Thank you, Tomo. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment on the uh, transition temperature and how that might need to be tuned if you start to actually incorporate your um, your coacervate forming ELPs into a, a real synthetic cell platform, for example, like in a GUV. Sorry, you want to know how would I incorporate them? Yeah. So with the transition temperature, I'm not sure that a GUV would necessarily be um, like stable at those at, the, at a higher trend, um, temperature. And so if you wanted, could you just change yeah. the handle is what I'm asking? Yeah, or when you when you engineer one of those CLPs, you can engineer the gas residue to alter the transition temperature. So if we don't wanna work at higher transition temperatures, like in this case, when we're working in 50 degrees, we can engineer proteins that uh, transition temperature in colder temperatures. I mean, I'm talking, we can go for from 10 degrees to 50 degrees, 20, 30, we can really engineer them as we want. And we can also engineer these uh, IVPs to undergo other type of stimulus such as pH or osmolarity or concentration stimulus or viral uh, intrinsically or proteins have exclusively, for example, some of them nucleic acid stimulus. So we can always overcome the, the problem of uh, temperature uh, in many different ways. Okay, yeah, great. Um, we have a, a question from the audience from David Gonzalez. Uh, when you redissolve the coassivates, does the single big coassivate in the water and oil droplet consistently break into multiple droplets while redissolving? No, actually, when you see it forming, it's uh, multiple droplets that coalesce together. But when you redissolve it, you don't see that phenomena. It's a, it's a more, it's a much faster phenomena, the dissolution than the formation. And the dissolution is not a, sing, a big coacervate uh, breaking into multiple things that you see deforming. It's, a, it's more like a super quick uh, resolubilization. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Tomo. Uh, well, actually, it looks like we do have one more question. Um, did the polymers show hysteresis in heating and cooling cycles? Yeah, uh, it depends. Some polymers uh, do and some polymers don't. E3 as they show, doesn't show uh, hysteresis, or if it shows, it's very, very minimal. Uh, other domains that we have engineered with uh, some uh, uh, 
other proteins that we, we have engineered with domains that are not intrinsically disordered, for example, that have secondary structures. Uh, in a concentration dependent manner, they do exhibit hysteresis and sometimes you get irreversible complex. And, uh, and that's something also nice because uh, we know more or less now where to go if we want to have a, a hysteresis or not. Okay, great. Well, thank you. We're gonna move on um, to our next presentation. She's from Sadaf Pashapur. She is a grad student in the cellular biophysics um, department of the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research. And she's also um, affiliated with the University of Heidelberg in the chemistry department. She works in the lab of Professor Jochen Schwarz in the microfluidics group um, for building synthetic cells. So Sadaf, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? See me? All my, my slides, everything's there? Yeah, good to go. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, um, so as Dr. Gilora already said, I am a PhD student in the group of Professor Joachim Schwarz, and I want to present you today my PhD work in general. So I'm working on a generation of exocellular matrix protein-based microcapsules to further investigate single cells. So in general, we are of course not the first ones who came up with the idea of establishing protein capsules. So for example, what is already out there currently, what you can do is for example, code such silicon oxide beads with here in this case, serum albumin proteins, and then use um, hydrofluoric acid, for example, to remove this template in, or and in order to receive such capsules, what you can see here. Another method is, for example, to make organic droplets and then further absorb again here. They also used albumin proteins around these droplets and then by air drying, basically, which you can see here, you can just get at the end this kind of protein capsules, which they're showing. And a third method is also basically um, built on this layer by layer assembly. What you can see here is that, um, yeah, people are coding first lipids and then a layer of albumin and repeating these steps in order to generate such coded and um, polysterine colloids at the end. And then by using hydro, hydrogen chloride, it's possible to remove this template. So in general, as you can see, there's a lot out there already, but for our main goal for investigating single cells, it's not very suitable because on the one hand, people are currently only using serum albumin proteins, but of course we can just exchange this with our ECM proteins, but this would still not solve our issue because um, for example, removing the templates are very harsh in all of those cases. Like they're either using very harsh chemicals or even air drying, which we could never do if we have living cells on the inside of such capsules. And also the other idea, you can say, okay, let's encapsulate cells in the protein capsules after they're formed. But even this is not possible because once the um, ACM proteins are polymerized, you cannot enter or you cannot um, encapsulate anything anymore. This is why we are completely focusing on droplet-based microfluidics, which is a very amazing tool at the end because what we can do is encapsulate single cells with the protein of choice and their ionic con uh, conditions, everything that we need in order to establish such protein capsules, you can just encapsulate everything in one container. And then by charge made interactions, we can attract those protein to the periphery. So just step by step, how it's working or how the process is like, you know, functioning. What we are doing is we're incorporating negatively charged surfactants into those PEG PFPE surfactant layers. And those negative charges are attracting our positively charged calcium ions. And this in turn attracts the soluble protein, which are slightly negatively charged. In this case here, it's lamine, for example. And then the good thing is also that calcium is not only attracting the protein to the periphery, but additionally also cross-linking it and polymerizing in place to have at the end such kind of yeah, protein polymerized capsules in the droplets. So this is how it looks in a very quick time-lapse video. So this is around one and a half hours where you can see how the protein inside each of the droplets is like basically popping <laughs> to the periphery. And also here in green, you can see the Haka cells encapsulated in our protein microcapsules. And this is basically all the results kind of summed up what you can do. 
as for example here we have laminin um, and we can attract it very nicely to the periphery and also what we are focusing on is using multigel but we are diluting the multigel down to just the protein constellation to like really work with this laminin collagen based mix and attract this to the periphery in both cases very nicely possible also with the hackard cells and we can even encapsulate also jerkard cells so in theory there is no limitation to cell or even protein type to attract and mix in this kind of conditions but of course this is not our end product let's say because we want to have the capsules finally in order to investigate the interaction of the cells with the ecm so what we have to do is release the capsules and this is like basically um there yeah, are two three step process so what we have first is our droplets um, and we are adding a drop of PBS or any kind of media on top of it. And then we have already the first contact of the droplets with the media. Then by adding a destabilizing agent, we can disassemble the wall and have then our capsules basically released into only the PBS phase with or without cells, of course. And this is how our capsules look in real life. So um, also, um, when you have in mind the first images of the protein capsules I showed you, so proteins when they polymerize and yeah, they, they kind of look like this. <laughs> so we have very polymerized structures here. These are empty protein capsules. And here when we encapsulate the Hackard cells, it becomes even more evident that we have polymerized structures because you can see this very nicely tent structure around the cells. And this you can do also with the Jerkard cells here in the middle and then the tent like structure here uh, from both sides basically. And here with the multi-gel capsules, now it becomes even more clear that we are really diluting the protein. Otherwise we would have a gel bead. But since we really have those empty, here the empty capsules or here again, that the cell is stabilizing the capsule wall, the hackard or the jerkard cells, we can really speak of protein capsules, not a protein bead basically. And yeah, this um, actually leads me directly to my outlook. So, um, um, basically, my vision is very broad for this kind of capsules. We can really go on and use now those capsules for various kind of um, analysis. For example, we can just on a very like simple single cell analysis encapsulate um, normal cells and then their, the cancer type to it, for example, and then see how the cells are interacting in such dense protein areas. Further, we can also go ahead and check, for example, how the cells are communicating between such protein barriers, like having cells on the outside and the inside, and then see if we can trigger some degradation of the capsule, cell migration, what's going on inside the cell. So they're very um, interesting fundamental questions which you can ask and hopefully also answer with this kind of capsules. And since we're also more in the context now, of course, of the synthetic cells, another idea would be just to encapsulate um, GOVs with different kind of integrins and then see how those GOVs are interacting with the proteins. For example, if we use laminin, martigel, or even fibronectin capsules, which is possible, and then see how the integrins are interacting and how the GOV might deform or not. A very, yeah, another big idea basically is like to use those capsules that we have in a kind of mix and match situation where we might be able to establish a 3D in vitro system where we can just establish any tissue type we want just by using, for example, Hackard cells in laminin capsules or like any fibroblasts in fibronectin capsules and then see how they're interacting, how it's stacking. Like, yeah, also many questions which you can answer here or even pose at the beginning. Um, yeah, with this, I'm actually already at the end of my presentation. I want to thank for Professor Joachim Spatz, of course, for um, all the help and everything in the lab and all my co-workers and thank you all for your attention. Excellent, thank you for sharing your work with us today, Sadaf. I have a question for you. Um, I'm wondering if you've ever tried to encapsulate more than just one cell type and more than just one cell within the protein capsule and what might happen if you say have, have more of like a cluster of cells. Yeah, that's actually a very interesting point. I mean, on the one hand, we sometimes, as you can see here, sometimes it happens that more cells are encapsulated by accident, basically. But here, unfortunately, I cannot very, uh, I cannot establish cells, uh, capsules with the cells because the protein, so the droplet gets bigger. But it is possible to tune this to just use more cells and also then increase the protein concentration. 
and then basically go in the direction of um, like spheroids, for example, this type of spheroids inside those capsules and then see if we go like even further into cancer spheroids and then see if maybe this kind of um, cell collectives can degrade the capsule much better than just a single cell. And also um, for the other point, mixing two different kinds of cell types, I also didn't do that yet, but this would be also very interesting to like either make spheroids before and encapsulate the whole thing and make capsules or even try to establish um, different kind of cell types, spheroids inside. But yeah, this is, yeah, like an experiment yeah. waiting. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, we do have a question from the audience. Um, how would you incorporate the GUV inside the capsule? Um, would the GUV interact with the charged surfactants as well? Yeah, it would probably um, interact with the charged surfactants, true. Um, an idea would be maybe to use um, PICO injection, which is also a very cool tool in the microfluidic, like, um, yeah, toolbox basically. So I can establish the droplets first on chip and then let it polymerize at the periphery, the protein first, and then inject some GUVs probably, which should stay inside them. I would probably also need to play with the sizes of the droplet to get only just one GUV, but um, this would be one idea to just pico inject the GUVs inside the droplets and then kind of release it. All right, excellent. Thank you very much um, for the nice presentation. And we'll move on to our last presenter for today who is um, Dr. Hendrik Hale. Um, he is a group leader at Starlin University in the experimental physics group of Professor Karen Jacobs um, at the Center for Biophysics. Um, so Dr. Hale, when you're ready, may I share your slides, great. Yes, yeah, so I can, I hope you can hear me and uh, can see my screen. Is, was this a yes? Okay, so then, um, yeah, thank you for the introduction, Jacqueline, and um, well, uh, thanks to the organizers also to, uh, yeah, for giving me the opportunity here to uh, present my project also to this whole audience. So, um, so I guess already from the title, you can guess in which direction this, uh, this project goes, and I also think I don't have to introduce into the, to this audience um, how important uh, um, encapsulation or um, compartmentalization in nature really is. So, but the question is in nature, um, so for cells and organelles, uh, in principle, only lipids are used. So, um, question is why nature doesn't use uh, for this also its usual building blocks and machinery, so uh, proteins. And this um, question especially popped up when we stumbled across these uh, class of proteins called hydrophobins. Um, this is a, a class of proteins which just share the same feature, namely they are extremely amphiphilic. And so they would be um, perfect building blocks for such bilayers. And this is, this is a basic what this uh, project is about. So what we took is um, one, of, one member of this class, which is called HFP1. This is a fungal hydrophobin produced by a, a filamentous fungus. Um, it's quite small, so 2.5 to 3 uh, nanometers in diameter. It's extremely stable um, and it features a heterophobic patch, which has since about 20% of the protein. So this makes this protein extremely amphiphilic. It goes to, uh, in principle, every, air, uh, every water interface and forms a um, um, yeah, monolayer film of proteins, which is extremely stable. The proteins are um, ordered in such a crystalline structure in these, uh, in these films, and uh, they won't desorb again anymore, which means that these films um, always keep uh, their surface area. As you can see, for example, here in this, um, in this drop experiment where we just put a uh, sessile drop on a, on a hydrophobic surface and uh, let the water evaporate. So this means you get extremely stable films, which have a pure hydrophilic and hydrophobic um, uh, can I interrupt you for one second? I'm sorry, we're just not seeing your slides. Um, they're not advancing forward. I'm fr I'm frozen on my screen, and I think our colleagues as well, okay. the other panelists. So then I try to stop this and try to to try it in a different way. Uh, so. Uh, 
Uh, can you see it now? Um, I have a dark screen. It says that you're sharing, but um, double click to enter full screen mode. That's for me, I think. So I'm now already in full screen mode. Yeah. So. See the same Jacqueline. Thanks, Alma. That's strange. What to say? So Can you see it now? Still no images. Sorry? No slides. No, slides. no it's still no the black slides. screen. Yeah, it just says that you're screen sharing. Um, but it doesn't have the slides, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Sorry, it's just. And maybe we can try uh, leave the webinar a second and re-enter. I'm not sure what else we could try. Are you using PowerPoint? I'm using PowerPoint, yes. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, there they are. We got okay. it. Okay, great. So okay, great. Yeah, sorry for this. So no, then, it's okay. Thank you. Okay. Um so uh yeah, what I wanted to say is that okay, what you can see here is the structure of this protein. Um as I said, it's quite small uh, and features a uh, quite large hypertrophic patch. And um, yeah, what I wanted to say about the um, uh, about the surface films, um, well, as you can see here in these in these droplets here. So this is how such a droplet um, with the proteins in it um, evaporates, and the, the surface film stay, still stays constant. So um, as I said, what what we have here, or what these proteins build, are really are like nice monolayer films, very stable at the air, air water interface. And uh, well, of course they feature one um, hydrophilic and one hydrophobic side. And so our idea was just, well, why not bring two of these films together and form a bilayer with it? So at least we did now in a microfluidic setup, as you can see here. Um, so we just use a, such a cross-channel um, geometry and uh, uh, formed in principle just two interfaces. Um, which are separated by, by a, a second phase, like for example, here's some oil and then the aqueous solution from top and above. And uh, we bring these interfaces um, in vicinity and then they snap into contact and form a bilayer. So the funny thing is that we also can um, invert these phases here and having oil fingers with buffer separating them. And this means that we can um, create also these inside out bilayers. So uh, with the hydrophilic parts of the proteins in contact. So moreover, in this setup, we can directly um, determine the tension that builds up in this bilayer and also the adhesion energy between the sheets. And uh, by introducing electrodes, uh, measure the thickness of these bilayers. So uh, the thickness measurements directly tells us that we indeed produce here oil-free bilayers with a thickness of roughly six nanometers. And uh, the tension in these bilayers is mainly determined by just the choice of the, um, of the two liquids. Um, but what we see is that we have um, a stable bilayer even for uh, bilayer tensions over 50 millinewton per meter. And I have to say that the lysis tension for a typical lipid bilayer would be around 10 millinewton per meter. So the interaction strength between the two sheets um, is for the hypophobic core case more or less the same as for, uh, as for a lipid bilayer, so roughly one millijoule per square meters. It is a bit higher if you invert this just because of the higher polarizability of the side groups here. Um, in elasticity measurements, we also see uh, the, quite the yeah, stiffness and the, um, the strength of these bilayer and the stability. So um, what we did here is uh, producing a dry bilayer by a Langer schaefer like technique. So lifting, lifting it up and picking up with, an, um, with a substrate. Um, the substrate features uh, micron-sized holes. So what we have here now are four spanning bilayers, which we can then indent with an AFM tip and uh, with this stretching the bilayer. So what we see now 
is that we get an out and Yang's modulus of roughly five gigapascals, which is um, roughly one order of magnitude higher than for typical lipid bilayers. Another important uh, property of bilayers is, of course, the, their water permeability. And this we tested in such a um, droplet interface bilayer setup. Um, so where we have two, two droplets surrounded by, uh, by an oily phase and uh, yeah, an osmotic pressure between these two droplet, droplets. And what you should normally see is that one of these droplets is increasing in volume and the other one is decreasing. But interestingly for our uh, hydrophobic bilayers, um, it's really hard for us to see anything. So even if we increase the uh, osmotic um, gradient to roughly one, one osmolar or so. So the, um, the powerability is roughly one to two orders of magnitude lower than, than for monooline bilayer, which is already uh, one of the lipids that has an extremely low permeability. But well, now, so the next step, if we want to form um, uh, compartments is of course, um, you know, form these. And uh, this we did now by um, a technique called microfluidic jetting, which is in principle just uh, blowing soap bubbles on a very small scale. And uh, with this, we can produce vesicles in the range of uh, roughly 100 microns or so. And we can do this uh, as a, with these well, normal bilayers, but also with the inverted ones. And it's also possible to do this with uh, even air in air bilayers. Um, so, but from this, the next step is of course then um, putting some functionality into these bilayers. And this we tried first with uh, inserting um, a molecule called dramacidine A, which is a small peptide, which normally um, introduces into such a, a lipid bilayer and forms their um, a beta helix. And um, yeah, via diffusion, it will then look for its counterpart on the other side of the leaflet. And with it together, it will form then uh, a channel uh, where monovalent ions like uh, sodium or potassium can pass. And it is blocked by divalent ions like uh, calcium, for example. And this is exactly what we also see in our situation here. So uh, an opening and closing of the channel and uh, blocking uh, with calcium ions. So with this, I already want to close and just uh, as a quick summary. So we are able to, um, to produce bilayers and, and vesicles with the, from, these, uh, from these native proteins, these native fungal heterophobins. And they, these layers are similar in size and adhesion uh, to normal lipid bilayers, but they are much stronger and less permeable for water. Well, at this, at this stage of this uh, project, it's clear that the outlook is much, much bigger still than what we have already achieved. So what we want to do in the future is uh, change and control the properties of these bilayers by, on the one hand, insertion of other transmembrane proteins, or for example, also just uh, changing the, the properties of the building blocks themselves. And of course, explore this then as uh, the, these cap capabilities of these things as synthetic cells, uh, drug carriers, or maybe just as an alternative matrix for transmembrane proteins. And so probably using them in, in niches where, um, where lipid bilayers will fail. So and with this, I want to yeah, thank uh, my whole group, all the collaborators, the funding agencies that of course you for attention. Great, thank you. Thanks for sharing um, your amazing work. Uh, we do have a question from the audience um, right away from Tom Robinson. He does great work and asks, oil in the bilayer is always a question. Do you test for that? Um, yeah, so as I said um, in between already that uh, we, we tested this with um, uh, measuring the, the capacitance of the bilayer and we compared this um, uh, with the situation where we uh, created this bilayer with air as a surrounding medium. So and in both cases, we got uh, more or less the same, cap uh, the same capacitance, um, which shows us already that there's no oil anymore in between. And um, so the MD simulations from our colleagues from theory also tells us um, that the oil molecules are in principle pressed out. Okay, great. Um, another question from David Gonzalez, a technical question. Are these proteins tricky to purify? Well, I have to, to say that I don't do this myself. So this is the work of our collaborators. <laughs> but um, I no, actually not because they, they accum accumulate at the water interfaces quite easily. So um, our collaborators also use these proteins to um, um, to attach genetically other um, domains they are really interested for just purifying these domains or these other proteins then. 
Okay, um, great. So with that, uh, we will go ahead and conclude our final session for the conference. Um, and on behalf of the conference chairs and the organizing committee, I'd like to thank everybody for their participation and for making this uh, such a successful conference. And yeah, thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your Thursday.